you stop tying your ego to your outcome. And so, meaning once you can have that thing where your ego is not tied to the outcome, it becomes a lot easier to compete. And so most people, what they do, and that, that's the most common, but they, they think about things that don't matter. You're listening to Spartan Combat on Spartan Up. Learn from battle-tested combat athletes with your host, Ryan Warner. Spartans! Welcome back to the combat series. Our guest today is Ben Askren, two-time national champion in Division I wrestling, former Bellator MMA champion. In this episode, Joe DeSena and Colonel Nye talk to Ben about how to reduce fear. Enjoy it, and we'll see you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Eurofins Scientific, the official testing partner of Spartan. Eurofins Empower DX at-home COVID testing collection kit is the fastest, cheapest, and most sensitive test on the market today. Go to empowerdxlab.com slash Spartan and use the code Spartan for 15% savings or free with most insurance. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Orgain. Clean nutrition to help you stay healthy, active, and feeling your best. New subscribers save 30% at orgain.com slash pages slash Spartan. All right, we are here for Spartan Up Podcast. We got a unique one. We got Ben Askren. Did I, did I say your name right, Ben? Yep, you got it. Ben Askren and Colonel Nye together because Colonel Nye is my um, go-to expert when it comes to any combat sports. We met, he was, uh, he was under Admiral McRaven, but he could tell you about it. And uh, he seems to know everything about everything when it comes to wrestling. As, as a fan, as I keep telling you, a fan <laughs> only. I always, always want to make sure you get that part. But so, Ben, I was just talking to Colonel Nye before you got on. And, and I'm sitting in a house of five boys. Oh, wow. They're all high-level wrestlers. One just, one just got um, dropped off at West Point. Um, and they have music playing downstairs. So I apologize if you hear some bass. But... But uh, you know, you probably know it all too well. Yeah. I got three. I got three little kids, so like half the time they they break into my studio. So now I actually have two two doors locked on the way to get there, so that it becomes extra difficult for them. I like it, and you probably zip tie your kids' uh, hands behind their back just to <laughs> work extra hard. Tell me about your child. Well, who'd you grow up with? Was it just you? Do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I, I had one brother, Max. He so we run wrestling academies together. Got the logo up here, Ask Wrestling Academies. We have four now in Wisconsin. Our fifth was supposed to launch in March, but it's a long story. It's going to happen very, very soon. Coronavirus pushes back a little bit. Um, and he went to Missouri with me uh, three years after me. He also won a national title in 2010. So we both have kind of a passion for wrestling and now a passion for coaching. Was dad a wrestler? He, you know what he was? Um, he wasn't like a really good wrestler or anything. He, I think he probably liked wrestling more than anything. He was kind of macho. Uh, but we did all the sports. Uh, you know, literally, we, I think there wasn't as many offerings, say, when I was a kid, like 1989, 1990, 91. There wasn't as many offerings as there is today in 2020. But I played soccer, uh, did a little bit of basketball, football, baseball, kind of, kind of everything. But I always tell people I was drawn to wrestling because of the individuality of it. And I love the fact that you kind of determine your destiny. And I even felt that as a young kid. But what's interesting to me, because I have four young children, even Colonel Nye, the supply, like he, he's got two superstar kids and I'm always looking not to make a mistake with my children. So I'm always selfishly asking people like you, like you and your brother turned out really well. You're, you're mm -hmm. in business, apparently. You, you're, you're, yeah. you killed it in sport. You, you get after it, you're smart. I've, I was actually on a podcast with, um, is it Gene? And I came right oh, after Zanetti. Zanetti. So I happened yeah, to. You were doing the rope, rope machine. I was doing the rope machine, and I was listening to you, and I was like, "Wow, this guy's smart. He's a good fighter, and he's smart." So how'd that happen? <laughs> uh, that that well, implies that implies that most fighters are dumb, right? Well, that is true. Anyone I who would my kids to be like Ben. Yeah, anyone who gets paid to get punched in the head for a living is. Uh, I tell people it's a shit career choice. It is not something you want to make your career. Uh, it, it, it happened for me. I, it was never planned from the start. Um, you know, one thing that I think that was really important, and, and sometimes I think my parents, maybe they didn't do things on purpose. They weren't sports psychologists, but they happened to do a lot of things really, really well. Uh, they modeled a good work ethic. My dad, uh, you know, he was always a hard worker, opened his own business in, I think, 1998. Um, so we saw him on that grind. My mom, um, she did this one thing where she, her brothers, I think, did like 5,000 days. 
but I think she ran for like a thousand days straight every single day for a thousand days. So we, we had really good work ethic modeled for us in the house. Um, and then the second thing I think is really important. My dad was really intense when I was a kid and I would say this, but at age 11, someone said, I, and I have no idea, this is a total stranger took him aside said, look, dude, you're, you're being a, a butt face. You need to back off and let your kid do the sport for himself. And at, at age 11, he backed off and he let me run with it. And that was like, so important for me because I know I would have really pushed back as I became a teenager and I didn't have that it was mine wrestling was mine and I got to make my own and I got to work as hard as I wanted to work and that was really instrumental so so it's modeling work ethic so I I agree with that I mean the neighborhood I grew up in there were a bunch of tough guys mm -hmm. but there were a bunch of business owners that like second third generation pizza places brickyards um, construction workers and it was like seven days a week. and you just see that and so yeah. that, that becomes normal to you as a kid. So I've probably seen mom run a thousand days straight. Mm -hmm. Dad building his own business. Yeah, right? huge, a huge, huge. And I, and I, you know, so I have, uh, like I said, three little kids. I have a seven, the one's going to be five in like a couple of days. And then the other one's two and a half. And I, I tried to do the same thing where I'm modeling it. Um, you know, especially when I was training last year, it's like, I would try to just have them come to my strength and conditioning. And I would just kind of let them play around. But I wanted to watch them. I wanted them to watch me struggle, right? See me struggle and see that it wasn't all just the limelight and glitz and glamour when I get to go fight in front of 20,000 people. But I want them to see the behind the scenes where I'm struggling, where I'm freaking miserable, uh, where I'm hating my life. And I'm grinding it out because that's what it takes. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. What are you going to do in your mind that are, with your kids now? They're going to they're gonna fight? Uh, well, <laughs> I kind of hope not. I hope not. Um, you know, I, I'm going to hopefully let them, let them and help them find their passions. Uh, my daughter, who's the oldest at seven, she does all, all sports. So she's done some wrestling. She's done gymnastics. She's done volleyball, soccer. Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I think that's probably all it's offered at that point in time, right? But she's done a lot of sports. Uh, my five-year-old, obviously, she's done a little bit of gymnastics. And we, we don't let the kids start wrestling until they're five at our academy. So she's pumped to start when she's five. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, kind of help her, guide, you know, help, hopefully help guide them all into whatever they can find their passion doing, whether it's sports, whether it's wrestling or, or anything else. Hey, awesome. hey, hey, Joe, real quick, as we've talked before, I mean, and Ben just hit on it there. I, I think with parenting, and I say this as a grandfather, so I'm a little bit older than you guys, um, exposure and opportunity, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of, to me, is, is the big thing. You want to expose your your kids, your grandkids, whatever, to as many opportunities as possible and let them kind of flourish in, in the one that they gravitate toward. But, but you do kind of got to push them off the couch to begin with Yes. To, to get them that exposure, right? So, Joe, for Spartan, ripping people off the couch is great, right? But if they don't become an elite Spartan athlete, that's fine. Maybe they're going to run 10 Ks the rest of their life, you know I mean? But, but you got to get them to do something. Yeah, I agree 100. percent My parents actually, their thing was, uh, you're either gonna play a sport or get a job. I, you know, I can't remember how early that started exactly, whether it was like 13 or whether it was 15. I don't remember exactly when, but that was definitely something they said. <laughs> so the, eh, I did work a little bit, but after that, I'm playing a sport, right? I, I'd much rather go wrestle than I would work, and I, I did work a little bit, but I never had like a consistent. Uh, job as a teenager because I was spending all my time in, in the basement wrestling because there was you know there wasn't at that point in time there wasn't these clubs that we could go to it was like I had a mat in 12 by 12 mat in my basement and I had to find people to come wrestle with me or I'd be lifting or whatever it was I could do to get better what, what does it take like, like what, what kind what kind of uh, commitment on a daily basis to get to your level how many hours man. oh man wow that's uh that would be hard I think that's a hard thing to say and the other thing is, I, I would never want to put a, a time thing on it because then people could say, well, I did the two hours a day and I didn't get to your level, right? There's, there's obviously no guarantee. Uh, I like the words that, that you guys said. It's only opportunity. Um, for me, it was, it was a personal obsession. And, and I, that's the one thing where I could say, like, if I could figure out what made me this obsessed and I could sell that, I would be a billionaire. There's just no doubt in my mind, right? I, I can't tell you what that was. But really... I quit. I finally quit football at age 14 when I was a freshman. I said, all I'm going to do is wrestle. And I was really, really obsessive about wrestling. And I, I, don't, I don't know what made me that way, but I, I tell people in, in my high school career, so from freshman year to senior year, 
I, I took less than 20 days off. Like I did not take days off. I was working out every single day and no one made me. It wasn't my parents saying I work out every day. It wasn't my coach. It wasn't anything. It was me. I put that goal out there for myself and I, and I followed through with it. That, well, that was the question I was going to ask because the little bit I know of you, you seem like a nice guy, but I, I wondered if there was that obsession in there, like that gritty, just yeah. pit bull won't let go kind yeah. of, but it sounds like that. That's the missing piece. So I guess when you match that attitude, that obsessive attitude mm -hmm. with skill and then work at, like that's the, that's the winning formula. Yeah, well, uh, good. I was just gonna say, and there's a bit of unique skill in there as well, right? I mean, you, you developed an entire, an entire technique or style different than everybody else. Yeah. So, so, so there's that. That didn't come along till later though. So, um, well, you got to have the basics first, right? Yeah, a, a thousand percent. Yes, you have to have the basics first. Um, yeah, so that, but that came out along out of necessity more than anything, right? Because I wanted to be successful. And when I got to college, right? So in high school, I was, I never had any success nationally. I started getting pretty good state level. In my late high school career, I started having success nationally and a very successful statewide. But then when I got to college, I really struggled. You know, you're in a wrestling room with a whole bunch of really good people. And I could beat like two, you know, two people anywhere close to my weight. And it sucked every single day you getting your ass kicked. And that's where it's like wrestling is a very interesting the collegiate level. And there's a very low retention rate because, hey, if you're a football player and you're not very good, you're going to like sit on the bench. You get to wear your jersey. You get to tell chicks you're on the football team. If you're a wrestler and you're not the guy, you're getting your face rubbed in the mat every single day. It is not a fun experience. So it really takes, it takes a lot of grit to want to stick it out. And so for me, that first year, I was getting my face rubbed in the mat a whole bunch. And I, and I hated that. And I wanted to have high level success. And I actually lost, I tell people I lost 10 matches within a six week span. And in high school, I lost seven matches in my high school career. And in college later on, after that red year, I would only lose eight matches. So like that for me, that was a whole bunch of losing 10 matches in six weeks. And so it was, okay, how do I figure this out? I, I want to have high level success. I'm not having high level success currently. What do I got to do? And that was where, you know, you go into, and it didn't all happen once, but how do I uh, pick these positions apart in order to figure out where I can win, where I'm not winning. And that was kind of like, again, that, that obsessive part of my personality that came out, I would just obsess over really specific positions and think like, okay, you know, so first it was studying other greats, right? Studying, and it, at that time it was hard because you could just go to a website, type it in and go. You had to find like TVDs or other stuff. You know, studying John Smith, Dave Schultz. What did these guys do from this position? And then after a while, I was like, okay, what did everyone miss? What did everyone miss that I can find? And, and so, right, I start dissecting all these positions and I start finding places where people missed. Where, where for the last 70 years of wrestling, people missed this, right? And now I start put, implementing these little pieces of my style. And, you know, I start creating this new thing that no one's really done before. And it, it really came out of this obsession of how do I win this position? How do I win this position? What are people missing here? And that's where it came from. That's awesome. And fairly unique. I mean, uh, Colonel Knight, again, you've been as a fan studying this for a long time. How many guys have their own style that they could describe? Like, Well, well I, think, I think a lot of the top tier guys, you can, you can, you could probably, uh, Ben could probably watch a video with their faces blanked out, you know, and he could tell you immediately who's wrestling. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, sure. fighters, wrestlers, whatever, all have a different style. But mm -hmm. how many of them have a style that other people try to copy? You know, you, you've got to be a top tier guy. I mean, and with Ben doing these cradles and rolling around and these leg things and, and funk, this funky thing, pe people didn't know what that was, you know, when he first started that. That was. I remember watching my son at a state championship wrestling match and that happened in front of us. And I looked at him and I said, or my son yelled, Oh, he funked him. And I said, what is that? I hadn't even, <laughs> that was 2005 ish, maybe somewhere in yeah. there. I mean, I, I didn't even know what that was. And then, you know, uh, later, like the next year, my son like did it to two people, you know, just kind of rolled them over like that. And boom, <laughs> done. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's different. Now, now it's not, but it was. Yeah, then. now it's more complex. Actually, you guys just sponsored. Um, I don't even know sponsorship. I, I don't know exactly what the correct terminology is, but you Spartan yeah, yeah. Up is now the regional training center of Cornell. Cornell, yeah, yeah, and and so now it, for me it's fascinating because wrestling. I mean, really life, but 
wrestling is, is there's this really fast evolution. And the reason I think the evolution happens so quickly is because all the top guys compete against each other really regularly. And so you get to find out what the best is, right? And sometimes with business or with other stuff, you know, you can have this person running over there. You can have this person running over there. And they're both having a moderate level of success. And they don't necessarily have to go head to head, right? And so you're not figuring out which, which way is best. In wrestling, that's not the case. And so there's been this really fast evolution from what I did to new stuff. And, like, for me, the, the, the forerunner of it is Yanni, who's at um, mm. Cornell. And, you know, I got, I got to coach him a couple times when he was younger. And he's just a brilliant mind. And, you know, so now there, there has – from where I went – there's been progression, and now he's kind of at the forefront of this new progression, in my opinion. I'm going to be at his house uh, Thursday night. I'm bringing my boys over there. Oh, nice. So, um, so that's good to know. Now you just gave me some information, something for me to oh, talk about. He's flipping brilliant. I mean, there's very, very few people in wrestling who I've ever uh, sat down and talked to where I have to, like, uh, really, really push myself to keep up with where they're at technically. You know, like he's talking through techniques, and I'm like, Oh, okay, I got it, got it, got it, got it. You know, most people are like, okay, I, you know, that's like third grade stuff. I, <laughs> I got that. And with him, I'm like, oh, crap. What's he, oh, oh, that's what he's talking about. Got it. Um, yeah, we actually, have, he came out last year to coach our kids. And um, I think we might get him again this year, potentially. So that's really positive. So it, has it been, it's been pretty much a straight shot outside of those little hiccups you had in high school in those first few matches in college. You've been winning nonstop. I'm, I'm being facetious. So, so <laughs> of course. This losing, this ability, this resilient mindset, this losing yeah. back. Tell us about that, because because uh, you seem to have ne figured it out. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I appreciate you being able to give me the pitch because I'm, I'm putting out a course on failure and adversity today. Um, and you know, one of the fantastic things I, that I think happened to me, and maybe this doesn't, and you know, this probably does kind of happen to everyone, but I just don't have such an insight into their lives. But I wasn't very good in the beginning, right? I had a lot of struggle to get good. So I, I learned how to deal with failure and adversity. And I was able to bounce back to every, you know, real quick. And I think one of the thing, first things that I believed in in my life in sports was that if I will outwork everyone. If you give me enough time, I will outwork them, right? And that was one of the first things I had a really deep-seated belief in. And, you know, I saw it come true because from fifth grade to sixth grade, I made a lot of progress to seventh grade made a lot of progress, eighth grade. I just, I kept thinking, if I have enough time, I, I will outwork you, okay? I will get better than you. And then later in my life, I start believing in a few other things also, right? And I have this set of core beliefs that are really important. But early, early on, that was it. And so for me, failure was nothing, right? Adversity was nothing. It's like, okay, I lost. Now, now I'm just gonna get better. Oh, you beat me that way? Okay, I'm gonna figure that out. Oh, I'm not strong enough? I'm gonna get stronger. And so in the beginning, it was just, hey, this is no problem. And I think that was, that, you know, having that early was really important to being able to keep bouncing back later. You know, whether it was the state, you know, obviously I told you the rough part of my redshirt year, but, you know, losing the state finals as a freshman was really hard for me. Um, not placing in like seven consecutive national tournaments between my freshman and sophomore and junior year was really hard for me. Losing in the national finals my freshman and junior, freshman and sophomore year of college, that was really hard for me. So, yeah, I mean, there was all those things along the way, but I think kind of it stems back from, that really early stuff where I just wasn't very good. And I knew I was willing to outwork everyone to get to the top. You know, I, I was talking to a neuroscientist uh, recently and he said, now that they're seeing that the process, the outworking that you're mm -hmm. talking about, actually that's where all the big drugs, the brain, uh, that's where all the big drugs are released by the brain. And it's not the finish line. It's not when you, when, when your arms go up and you won the match, yeah. it's all that work leading up. And, and so, at the core, I think what you're saying is if you're a hard worker um, and you enjoy that, yeah, basically just dust off the loss because you're going back to work. Yes. I mean, so that's, you know, the, and one of the probably, the mo in my opinion, one of the most important sports psychologists. I don't know if you guys have read Dweck at all. Um, Carol Dweck, she's fantastic. And, you know, if you read any sports psych, they will very, it's very likely that they'll cite her in some way, shape, or form. And that's, you know, another thing where you go back to like, hey, my parents did this. I don't think they were sports psychologists like Carol Dweck and they knew, you know, growth mindset versus fixed mindset, but they kind of knew it somehow. Somewhere inherently they knew, you know, don't focus on results. Don't tell me it's good or bad. Just, just work, right? Just get better. And that's really important. It's one of the things I think for people who fail to deal with struggle and adversity is their parents, um, 
they put a lot of emphasis on, on the results early on, right? And if you're winning, it's great. If you're losing, it's bad, regardless of anything else. And whereas, you know, when I'm coaching, and so my, my kids, my, my, my kids that I have at the house, they're not really old enough for that yet. You know, I kind of, they don't really get it. I talked to them a little bit about it. But the kids I coach, it's like, guys, the only thing I want out of you is great effort. If I get great effort in competitions, I get great effort in practice, I'm going to try to take care of the rest for you. I will try to take care of the rest. I will teach you the right technique. I'll put everything else in place. I'm not guaranteeing you success, but I think there's a really good likelihood of it. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, when you go back to that growth versus fixed mindset, I think that's, man, that is so vital for people, not only to have success, but to be um, me mentally healthy, right? To be very, because I think a lot of people who have that fixed mindset, there are people who have that that are, very successful, but they overanalyze everything. They overpressure themselves. And they don't realize, hey, man, if I, if I don't get this, I'm going to dust myself off, get back up, and I'm just going to do it again. No doubt about you know, it. I, I may get this wrong, Joe, but I, I heard an interview. I want to say it was Shaquille O'Neal, and I'll definitely get the time wrong, but his father, whatever trophy he got, he was only allowed to display it like on a mantle for a certain amount of time. Really? Very, very short, for like two weeks. And then they'd put it in a box and put it in a closet. Because his father didn't want him focusing on his success. He wanted focusing on, on what's coming next. Wow, that's awesome. So, yeah, yeah. there's I'll, different ways to do it, I guess. I'll tell you guys, that, 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 that runs right in line with um, – I tried writing a book in 2006 and seven with a, a sports – she was a sports psychologist. She got her PhD um, at Mizzou. And uh, unfortunately, it was never good enough, so we never ended up publishing it. And then we kind of went our separate ways, and we've never gotten back together and just finished it. But what we did, we sent out a questionnaire to every NCAA champion in the last 50 years, okay? Um, and one of the things that was the craziest for me was we put out a question that said, when did you go from good to great? And we were expecting some type of change in belief, change in training, change, right? Something, right? They would give us some type. That's kind of what we were expecting. That's what we wanted. And that's not what we got back at all. So what we got back was it was the it was the question that was answered most similarly. It was some form of I was never great. Okay? They might have said like, "Hey, I was never great. Dan Gable was great, but I had my best year when this happened." Uh, or you might your question assumes the fact that I ever got to greatness and I didn't. But, right? And then they would answer the question the, the way we wanted them to. But there were so many people who said I was never great. And right in 2006, I'd already won one NCAA title. I was on my way to my second one. And when I got that answer, I started really thinking deeply about it. It's like, well, I don't really think of myself in those terms, right? I know. And if you boil it down, if you quantify it, an NCAA Division I champion by any determination is great at wrestling. There's just no way you can say that they're not, right? We, I mean, this is a 0 .0001 percentile. And so what I thought was interesting is like, wow. You know, these people don't think in those terms. They think in different terms. I, and then at that point, I wasn't thinking in those terms either, right? And so it's like, okay. And then to, to what you said about Shaquille O'Neal, his, his dad wasn't thinking in those terms. His dad wasn't thinking, I had the success. Where am I? My level man. He's just thinking about progress. He was thinking about the future. And that's kind of, that was a huge turning point for me. And I probably already thought that way, but realizing that thinking that way was so important was really uh, pivotal for me. I, I agree, Colonel. And I, I think even with the business, um, I'm never satisfied. I drive everybody on the team crazy. As I'm listening to Ben and, and you talk about that story with Shaquille, um, I think it requires that relentless pursuit of getting better, right? We're never going to be perfect, mm -hmm. but let's keep yeah. but just keep tweaking. And I mean, the reality is um, you, never, you never really get there, right? Never. Yeah. And, but you got to be excited about continually chasing it. Mm -hmm. Um given you have this mindset, given you have this work ethic, no big deal to get in the ring. Let's talk about getting in the ring. Um, like just making the decision to fight. No, I mean, I mean, physically walking in, you know, some people, most people I would imagine are nervous, but, but since the outcome is not the thing you're focused on, you know, you yeah. out everybody, how do you feel getting in? Um, I, yes, yeah, so I would take, I would take the back to all, all competition. Um, and we, we talk about specifically the mixed martial arts cage, that is an interesting beast that like most people would have a fear of. Um, I would say, so I've been doing these things called Mental Mondays for uh, five, five years, maybe possibly more, where people that direct message me questions and I just go off on whatever topic. 
And I can tell you by far the most asked question, and it, it comes in different forms, but some type of, you know, my kid gets to the state tournament and they wrestle like crap compared to how they usually wrestle. Or my kid has a big match or some version of that, right? And, you know, the saying, the saying I've been starting to do a lot is stop tying your ego to your outcome. And so meaning once you can have that thing where your ego is not tied to the outcome, it becomes a lot easier to compete. And so most people, what they do, and that, that's the most common, but they, they think about things that don't matter. And when you're under the gun, when you're performing, and this could be right speaking, this could be competing in wrestling, competing in mixed martial arts. Um, you know, I know you guys do some military, right? You're on a military operation. It could be anything where you have, need to have a high level of performance or competition. If you're thinking about things that don't matter, generally that will lead to bad performance. So if you're thinking about, if I win this match, this is going to happen. If I win, if I lose this match, my dad's going to yell at me. It, oh my gosh, that guy, well, he looks really jacked, right? <laughs> all of those things, they don't matter at all. They don't, in order to have the good, best outcome, all you're really thinking about is how do I do this the best I can, right? How do I say wrestling? How do I get my hands on him? How do I move him? How do I get to his legs? How do I finish this shot when I get to the legs? Like you're really in the moment and that's all you're thinking about. And when you think about those external factors that have no bearing on the outcome, you're generally likely to have a pretty poor performance. It's funny, Colonel, and I don't know if you and I talked about it, but in ancient Sparta, we had the, the, the preeminent expert uh, come out of Cambridge, meet me in, ancient, in, in Sparta at the ruins. Really? And, yeah, and he said that's one so of- That's so cool. Uh, we have a race there every year in Sparta. Uh, which you're you're welcome to. We should stay in touch if you, if, if that fascinates in you. In Greece, yeah. Wow, that's that's awesome. Right, right, and you go right through the ruins, and so um, it's pretty it's pretty epic to to go. So you're wow. Matter, November. Let's talk about it. Happy to happy to get you there. Okay. Tell me we can get a U.S. citizen. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I kind of hijacked what you were going to say. <laughs> I am getting a new hip in like two weeks though, so who knows if I'll be racing by then. <laughs> but what I was going to say was um. What this professor said was the ancient Spartans didn't believe in legacy. It sounds like they didn't focus on those things that didn't matter that you talked about. What yeah. they cared about was doing a great fucking job right in front of them, right? The, the, the thing they had to do that day, do, do a great job, and then the legacy comes. So it sounds like a similar message. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's everything, right? And that's staying in the moment and not worrying about externalities that don't really matter. That's so important. And, you know, it's funny because uh, – I actually, the one sports psych thought that I have that I am going to write a book on someday because it's different. And actually, you know, now that I've gotten a little bit of fame, it's, it's fascinating because I get to message some of these really, the authors that I love and say, hey, what about this idea? Unfortunately, if they're really good, they're always too busy to write the damn book. But I have this thought that no one's written on. And one of the things I think that people in sports psychology struggle with is they'll, you get a sports psych book and say, do this, do this, do this, do this. And what it fails to mention is, how some of these things are, they're opposites. And you have to balance the opposites within, within your own mind. And so something like this, I was actually just talking to um, a lady who works with me yesterday. And so like in competition, like literally if I'm going to perform as good as I can perform, I need to be thinking about almost nothing. I need to be focused solely on what's you know, ahead of me. But generally people who uh, achieve high level success, they're also very A type personalities and they're really obsessive and they kind of like ruminate all the time about these things. And so mo lots of times like, hey, if I'm training, I want to have that like, what am I missing type mentality, right? Which is actually the opposite of the other one that right, the competitor needs to think about nothing. But the guy, when you, the same guy when he's in training needs to be obsessive about what am I missing? They almost need to be kind of like a little bit, par right? a businessman, should be a little bit paranoid a lot of the time. What am I missing? What are they doing? And those things got to balance each other. And you, you really, to be as successful as possible, you need to have both those things in your own brain and they, they're opposites. It's hard for a lot of people. So, so you're saying avoid decision fatigue. Get all the decisions out of your mind. Focus on what basically what the Spartans said. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, a coach, the right coach, should handle all that external worrying and everything. I don't know. I, th I think you should. I mean, so like you guys are military people, right? So it's like, what if, what if, you know, if your guys are preparing for a battle, you can't in the, in the lead up, right? In the battle, you got to think only about the battle, but in the lead up, you don't want to, you don't want to not uncover something that they might do that'll lead you to failure. Right. I mean, 
So in training, you want to be able to uncover everything yourself. You don't want to you know, flip over your soul. You want, you want to be obsessive. But that same mindset, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be negative towards you in competition. It'll be really beneficial to you in training. And so, you know, I'm sure you guys could talk about a whole bunch of stuff. When you're leading up the battle, you want to say, how can my opponent attack me? What are they going to try to do? And you want to uncover all those stones. And then when you're in the battle, you kind of have that stuff. It, it's already, you already know it, right? And then you're just ready to react and attack. Yeah, Joe, I think you probably saw it there as well. But in, in the military, basically, Ben, what they say, it's not the plan, it's the planning. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so that if you're spending, you, it's the taking the time and the effort and the energy to do the planning and figure out all that stuff so that when it's time to execute the plan, you know, when something goes wrong, uh, when you get punched in the face the first time, mm-hmm. you can adapt and, and go the other direction because you've thought through all those branches and sequels and all those what ifs uh, along the way kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then real quick before you say anything, I just, Joe, there's an author out there that's written three or four books, New York Times bestselling books and may have a little bit of time on its hands due to COVID. So Joe, I'm just throwing that out there if you wanted to. Uh... I, I was thinking that, Ben, let's <laughs> we could help. We could help if you want to knock out a book. All right, cool. Yeah, I, all right. We, I think we got to do a little more research. So I have the kind of idea, but we need to put the, you know, the oomph behind the research also. A little, a little bit of rigor. We'll yeah. Get, we'll, get, uh, we'll get a PhD. It's three letters we can get attached to a few names and get them in there. That's what what do you, everyone, I've, everyone I've talked to, you know, my, my favorite authors, uh, you know, Daniel Coyle has had some really great books. Um, oh, my gosh. Who's that? Who wrote Range? David Epstein. Um, has written some really great books. When I talk to these people, they're like, that's a really great idea, but I'm too busy. <laughs> no, but I have this other project going on. Um, so yeah, no, what you said about plan and planning, that's so important. And, and you know, where I always go with, cause kids do this, right? It's like, Hey, if five minutes before the match, if I tell you this guy does this and this and this and this and this and this, that's, that's going to be really negative. You're like, Oh shit, I got to deal with that yeah. and that and that and that. But listen, I should have done that. I should have done that in the practice room. If I didn't do that in the practice room, it is not going to help you five minutes before the match. So I like that where you said plan and planning, right? Um, because they are different things and it's a different mentality and you really need to have both of them. I yeah. agree. I agree with that. What do, you, what do you look like for time? It's 11 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, I, got, I, I booked out an hour, but uh, whenever you guys are done, we can be done. Yeah. Morning routine. You want to do that first? Well, you guys are going to get mad at me. I want to hear your morning routine. What do you got? Uh, I don't have a morning routine. I'm going to have to delete that whole section of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, here, you know what? I, I'm going to take it from a sports psych perspective, Joe. Um, what I think is important about morning routines, because I do think they're important for some people. Um, I think it's, about, it's all about getting your mind right. And it's all about getting your mind in the I'm going to accomplish stage, right? And so I'll just pull this off my desk right here. So it's like, I do this at night, but I have this whole book, right? Where I plan out what I, what I need to accomplish the next day, right? And every single day I'm obsessive about doing that. And so it's like, you know, I'm do, you're doing it in the morning, I'm doing it at night, right? I have my routine where I know what I need to get done and I get my mind right. So I like doing it before bed because I am that, I know I'm that obsessive type personality. And I know like for going to sleep, it's really, <laughs> it's really bad. Right. So I want to, I come down to my office at night and I kind of look through my calendar. I go through my thing. I write down everything I need to do the next day. And that's kind of this, right? So it's not a morning routine. It's a night for me. It's a night routine. I get my routine about what am I going to accomplish tomorrow? And so I think that's kind of that, that process is really important. And I would, I would argue whether you do it at night or whether you do it in the morning, I think as long as you're doing the process, that it's going to be okay. Switch, right. Switching gears. Um, what about, what, what, what advice do you have for somebody that's, um, they're afraid to fail? Which yeah. I, think, I think is pretty, it's, it's pretty common. It's very common. So yeah, so I, you know, I broke it up into the, so I have the broken down, the, the course broken down three sections. Number one would be kind of the way I think about success and failure. Number two would be the, the second section would be what we could do when we do fail or find adversity. And number three would be the three really pivotal points in my life where I, I failed big time and kind of what I chose to do from there. Um, and so in that first part, when we think about success and failure, I kind of break it down into three courses. Number one, Fear of failure macro, which means for the, the, the 40,000 of you 
why are people not starting something? Because we know there's a whole bunch of people who don't even start something because they're afraid they're going to fail. And you, know, you said this, Joe, anyone who does anything is going to fail at some point. Like, so the, the other part of it is like, okay, well, I'll just sit in my, <laughs> sit in my house and hide under my covers every single day because I don't want to fail. And for me, that, that's not a realistic option whatsoever, right? Um, and then, so then from there, we go on to the Dweck stuff, which is, I think is so vital, understanding growth first fixed mindset, understanding just because you failed doesn't mean you're a failure. You can keep going. And then we go into, have you guys ever heard of the Stockdale paradox? It's in the book, Good to Great. Yes. I think that's so important for people to understand. And that's kind of one of those. Um, so I actually call it my theory is the hypocritical mind, um, where you kind of have hold both these beliefs to be true, even though they're opposite of each other. Well, you know, a lot of people struggle with the Stockdale paradox because some people, when they're, when they're critical of themselves, which you need to be, they get too critical and it makes them kind of bring themselves down. Other people are optimistic, but they fail to acknowledge, you know, where they struggle, which is going to help them have success eventually. So the Stockdale paradox is kind of one of those hypocritical things where it's really hard for people because they got to have both things in one, right? Acknowledging where you're at, but never, never uh, failing to believe that you're going to eventually get to your end point. That's so... That's really important. And then the third part we talk about, like I said, the, probably the most asked question I've had is how do, I, how do I get to be an elite performer or competitor? And that, so we call that fear of failure minor, where you're, you're literally in the moment. I am in the moment where I need to go speak, where I need to go perform, where I need to go compete. How do I do that as, and give myself the best chance of success? I'm a, I'm a very, very optimistic person. Like I think the rest of us on this call are. Yeah. And I just... I would not have an issue if a date came and went. In other words, I'm, I'm, God forbid I'm a prisoner of war. Yeah. Date is um, Thanksgiving, I'm supposed to be, like it would not upset me because my mind would immediately go to the next holiday or the next, like I just, mm -hmm. I'm that optimistic, so. <laughs> so you've got it covered. I, yeah, I, just, I, don't, I don't know about you guys. Well, so like, I'll, I'll just tell you where that Stockdale paradox, like for me, where I just, I just know, like if I wasn't able to do this, I would not have had the success that I have. It's like, go back to my college freshman year. I told you guys that was kind of where, that was the impetus for me developing this new style of wrestling. Here's what, here's what I had to admit to myself. I had to admit to myself that I wasn't the athlete that other people in the room were. And so we're talking basic athletic factors, strength, speed, that kind of stuff. Like, I just wasn't. I was not. So I could have kept lying to myself and told myself that I could be as strong and fast as some of these other team. But the truth was, I couldn't be, right? So I had to admit that to myself. I had to admit I cannot be the athlete that these guys can be. That doesn't mean I still can't succeed, but how do I do it, right? Because I can't do it this way. So it's like, and a lot of people would have never admitted that to themselves. They would have kept lying. And they said, I, could, I, I can do it this way. I'm as good of an athlete. And, you know, so I had like, you know, just Tyron Woodley. That's the famous one that was on my team. But there was other really great athletes. Like, I am never going to run, jump, and lift like Tyron Woodley is going to run, jump, and lift. That, that being said, I have other strengths. How do I use those other strengths to make myself successful? And that was kind of what I did. But, you know, for that Stockdale paradox, you have to be willing to admit where you struggle then to see how you're going to succeed. Yep, makes sense. Colonel Nye, anything? Yeah, yeah I struggle getting up in the morning. That's why I don't have that morning routine, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fear of failure. Let's get really succinct. Let's get it down to um, three specific things people can do. Yeah. Um, so the fear of failure minor, right? The, when, when we're literally in the moment. Um, so I, th I think you need to first acknowledge how you're going to compete your best. And like, like we kind of talked about earlier, it's, it's obviously not thinking about things that don't matter. So, you know, if I told you, Joe, here's how you do a sing leg. Are, are you going to be great at it on the first time you do it? And the answer is that obviously not, right? It, take, it takes a lot of practice. And so, you know, some people get discouraged because you tell them this is what you need to do. And then they go try and they can't do it the first time. Well, you're very rarely good at something the first time you do it. And so for me, it's all about reps. And that's kind of one thing I think we go wrestling to MMA, why a lot of wrestling people have success because they're great competitors. Because, you know, as wrestlers, you guys have kids that wrestle. They've probably had hundreds and hundreds of matches, very likely, right? And so they get to practice this mindset over and over. So, you know, acknowledge what, mind, what mindset you need to have, which is not think about other things, and then practice it. Because are you going to struggle? Yeah, of course. Are you going to be perfect the first time you do it? No, definitely not. And so that would kind of be, 
you know, the number one, uh, you got to get that down. You got to have that. And so like I said, wrestling, we get a lot of practice. And so I'll tell you guys for, for my speaking, one of the things I forced myself to do, cause I said, I, you know, speak, being able to speak is very valuable. And so one of the things I did to myself was I did Facebook live a lot right now. I might do Periscope, with her, but understanding that I'm going to flip this camera on a bunch of people are going to be watching me and I'm going to, I'm going to mess up. Right. And I'm not recording it because if I'm recording it, I get to start over. Right. I guess, ah, no one heard that one. Boop, start over. Mm, no one heard that one. Boop, start over. Right. If I'm live, I'm going to mess it up and I'm going to have to continue. And I'm going to have to realize that that mess up is going to happen. And it doesn't matter. I just got to keep going. So like for speaking, that is a huge one for me. I, I literally forced myself to practice, to not have that fear, you know, fear of failure. Right. Because a lot of times when people, they will prep their speeches in a mirror. Right. And so the, what they, they mess up, they start over, they mess up, they start over. Listen, when you're in front of a crowd of 500 people and you're giving this big speech, do you think you're going to get to say, Hey guys, I messed up. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually going to start over. No, you're not going to, you just got, you just got to keep rolling. You just got to keep going. And so like, for me, that was how I do it. So for me, it, it's, pra it's knowing it and then practicing it over and over and over again and figuring out ways for you. Like for me, I'm not going to get the opportunity to speak in front of big crowds all that often but I can flip on my Facebook live or my Periscope whenever I want and force myself to practice. What would you do over if you had to do, if you had to do anything over? Um, well, it's a funny question because I tried, I try not to think, you know, kind of think about, like talked about those guys and greatness and like, I always think about progress. I try not to think about anything that hadn't has happened in the past because you literally can't change it, right? It would be ideal if you could, but you can't like, hey, would I like to be in the ring with George Moss but all again? And <laughs> I know he's going to jump at me with his knee. Yeah, damn right I would, right? But I don't, I don't get that again, right? So I tried to never like think about what I can do in the past. And if I had to learn some of the lessons the hard way, I try to pass those lessons on to the next generation and think about how, um, you know, how I can do that really well. Um, so I, man, I always like to say I have no regrets. If I didn't do it, I didn't do it. If I failed, I failed. I'm moving forward and I'm going to try to use those lessons to help make me better in the future. I love it. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Eurofins Scientific, the official testing partner of Spartan. Eurofins Empower DX at-home COVID testing collection kit is the fastest, cheapest, and most sensitive test on the market today. Go to empowerdxlab.com slash spartan and use the code SPARTAN for 15% savings or free with most insurance. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Orgain. Clean nutrition to help you stay healthy, active, and feeling your best. New subscribers save 30% at orgain.com slash pages slash Spartan. Thanks for listening to this episode of the DECA series on Spartan Up Podcast. Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Tuesdays, you can find Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, interviewing biohackers, business leaders, authors, and athletes. Thursdays and Saturdays, catch episodes from our DECA, Endurance, Trail, Combat, and La Ruta series. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation, tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time.